Welcome back. Let's move on to forces acting on the dislocation, a pyral stress, which is the force required uh, to move a dislocation through a crystal. So the pyral's Nabarro force is the resolved shear required to overcome frictional forces in the lattice. Right? By frictional forces, we mean the bonds that we're distorting. Um, and it's the force that is going to have to be overcome to move a single dislocation. The theory was originally uh, developed by Pyrles in the 1940 and then expanded by no Nabarro in, in uh, a few years later in 1947. And it's completely a consequence of the distortion in the lattice caused by the presence of a dislocation. Right? When we talk about plasticity, we'll be talking about and strengthening, we'll be talking about obstacles in the path of the dislocation. Here, we're not. The pyral stress is in a perfect lattice, a single dislocation. It's just the frictional force caused by the lattice, of dis the, the distortion of the crystallographic lattice. So where does this come from? Well, as I move, we'll look at this edge dislocation. As I move the edge dislocation, my extra half plane here, as I move it over one Berger's vector distance, I have to go through a higher energy configuration to move. My highest energy configuration is going to be at B over two. I have an unstable equal, I'm at an unstable equilibrium, right? Where I have momentarily have zero force. I mean, with my displacement, this is force, so I have zero force, but I'm in the highest energy configuration. So it's going to want to snap back this way or this way uh, to my minimum energy configuration. So the pyral stress is a function of the lattice distortion caused by the dislocation itself. And we can parameterize this distortion um, by the width of the dislocation or the width of the, of the dislocation core. So what do we mean by dislocation width? Well, let's consider the differential displacement above and below the slip plane. So here's our slip plane. If we look at an atom below it and, a bat and an atom above it, and we look at how much they're displaced relative to each other, uh, that's our differential uh, displacement. So our the max is at B over 2. So the width of our dislocation, our, our max displacement happens at Berger's vector over 2. And so we're going to call the width, we're going to define it as the distance where our differential displacement is greater than one half of our maximum, which gives us our differential displacement of a Berger's vector by four. And usually we have to go out, depending on the type of the structure, the crystal structure and the, and the type of bonding, we typically have to go out anywhere between one Berger's vector distance, right, here's our Berger's vector distance, we have to go out anywhere between one and five Berger, Berger's vectors in distance is what we define as our, diff, or our width. So it's a little easier to see here. Here's our, in a close packed structure, a metal. Here's our B over four differential distance. We have to come out a fairly wide way, about five Berger's vector, all right? So our distortion is distributed throughout the, la the lattice. A large number of atoms are incrementally shifted from their equilibrium positions. If we have stronger bonding, like in a ionic crystal or a ceramic, our uh, Distortion is concentrated into a much smaller area. It takes 
a much smaller number of atomic steps before our incremental displacement shrinks to B over 4. So our distortion, our strain, and our strain energy is smushed into a much smaller uh, area. And you can see, so FCC metals, right, we have very wide dislocation widths, very small pyral stress, right? You can imagine that this is much easier to move uh, than this dislocation. And it has a much smaller te temperature sensitivity. Compare that to ionic ceramics or even covalent ceramics where our width is very small, our distortion is is smacked in there into a very close area. We have very large pyral stresses that are, are difficult to move, and they be gain a very it gains a very strong temperature uh, dependence. So I'm not going to go through the derivation, but our pyral stress is proportional uh, to the shear modulus, right? and it's going to vary depending on uh, what the slip plane is, right? Which what what the uh, uh, Berger's vector is, and what the what the plane, what the what the slip plane is. So if we consider as d as our interplanar spacing, and our slip distance is the Berger's vector, right? For a fixed d spacing, right? Our pyral stress is going to increase as our Berger's vector increases. So that means we're going to slip along di directions that minimize our Berger's vector. So we're going to slip along close pack directions where we can, or nearly close pack directions. And if we fix our Berger's vector, we can see that as d gets closer, as our planar spacing gets closer, our pyral stress increases. Right? So our close pack planes are the most separate, separated in our crystal. Right? A non the lower the the density the closer uh the planes right so it's much more difficult to move a dislocation on a non close packed plane than on a close packed plane so slip is going to tend to occur along the close packed plane along the close packed directions on the close packed planes if at all possible right so FCC, close pack planes are 111, close pack directions are 101. BCC, we don't have close pack planes, but we're going to slip along the close pack directions, the 101 directions. HCP, right? The easiest uh, slip system for many crystals, for many HCP is on the basal plane, the 001 plane, along the prismatic uh, directions in those uh, in those crystals. All right, and it all comes down to uh, how difficult it is to move dislocations on other slip systems. Right, the the slip that's going to carry our, the dislocations that are going to carry our deformation are going to tend to be those with the lowest uh, pyral stress. So what's the consequence of this pyral stress? And it's really uh, kinking, right? So to glide, dislocations have to overcome the pyral's Navarro barrier, right? Now, we know that we're going to move perpendicular to our dislocation line, but our stress isn't uniform here. We're not going to shift this whole dislocation at once. Dislocations move in a step-like fashion, right? A small section has enough driving force on it that it boop, will pop over, creating a kink. Now, the kinks are distinct from jogs. Jogs are going from one plane to another, 
kinks are completely in uh, the slip plane, right? And then these kinks will then spread laterally along the length of the dislocation. So now this portion of the dislocation will move this way. This one will move this way, right? And that's how uh, the dislocation moves forward. So the kink widths are a balance between the line tension of the dislocation, which we'll talk about in just a minute, um, and the pyrals barrier, right? So, but what's important to remember now is, is kinks tend to be narrower and more difficult to move in less close packed structures. In close packed structures, they tend to be more diffuse uh, and much easier to move. Right, so kink here, so here we see our kink. This is our main velocity. This will tend to move out this way. This will tend to move out this way. And uh, the book has an, an excellent um, description of this. But this has, we're only moving really a small section of our dislocation line at a time. So kink motion has a, a pretty low activation energy, right? The net effect of the kink motion is to move this dislocation forward, right? We're essentially we, we're replacing moving a large dislocation line length, line length, a small incremental amount forward with removing a small dislocation line length a long distance, but it gives us the same net slip effect in the end. And the nucleation of these kinks does have a, a temperature dependence associated with them. All right, and so the pyral stress is the force that we have to overcome to cause slip. But what's the driving force? Uh, Force slip. We'll talk about this more when we talk about in the next little bit of this the Petch Kohler um, uh, formulation, but I'll just introduce it here briefly. So this is our strain energy density, right? If we think about this, is the average displacement. Of above the slip plane to that below, right? This is ds, our line length. So ds dl by a, right, is that um, above and below, right? And so our force is then given by the der the derivative here. Right, so we're left with tau b, right? Tau is the um, and we can write this in terms of the traction vector, but basically we have a force, it's going to be acting perpendicular to our dislocation line, and it is the resolved shear stress times the Berger's vector. Uh, the magnitude of it, the directionality of it is going to be the projection of our stress tensor on our Berger's vector, which is our traction vector, crossed with the line length. Right? So it's going to be a vector that's always perpendicular to the line length. Right? And that's our driving force for slip based given the stress field at a point. Another important force acting on the dislocation is the line tension, right? So what do we mean by line tension? Well, we have to do work to create new dislocation length, right? Imagine if I had a straight dislocation and then I bent it, made it curved, I have to increase its length, which means I have to hold a force on it, right? I'm in a higher energy configuration. 
There has to be a force. Um, on it to keep it bent. Or you can think about it as line tension is the force that minimizes the energy by shortening the length. Right? And that line tension has a, a form that's going to be the shear modulus uh, times the Burgers vector divided by two times the radius of curvature of the dislocation line. So as our dislocation becomes perfectly straight, our radius goes to infinity, right? Our force acting on the dislocation, our force holding it in the curved state goes to zero. But as we make a really small radius, our force becomes, our, our line tension becomes uh, quite high, right? And this line, this line tension is very important when we talk about strengthening mechanisms and plasticity, when dislocations have to curve around obstacles or slip around them. And we'll talk about that uh, uh, next week. So I uh, meant to include this in the last video. Uh, so again, sorry for the jump cut. If we go back to the driving force for slip, F equals tau B. Tau, of course, is the result of shear stress. So the force is always perpendicular to the dislocation line, but our result of shear stress is going to be constant on the whole slip plane. So that means to produce the same deformation, the same result of shear stress generates the force on a screw dislocation that's going to be perpendicular to the force on an edge dislocation. Right? All four of these configurations produce the same final offset right from the same st applied stress we're going to have the same tau but our dislocations are going to move in uh, different ways but the force acting on our screw is perpendicular to the force acting on the edge and this just goes right back to the geometry of uh, dislocation motion that we uh, talked about at the very beginning of this lecture. And this slide was shamelessly stolen from Professor Zagili um, uh, from University of Virginia. And I got a couple slides in the next recording also that I stole from him. So in the, the interest of full disclosure, I didn't take his name or anything off the slides. Um, but he's got a couple. And I'm going to link uh, on Carmen to some additional notes from him. This is a course, Defects and Microstructures, very similar to the Structures and Defects course, uh, the defects part that uh, Professor Ghazi Saidi taught. Um, but he's got some really nice notes, and uh, I'm going to put a link to them uh, on the Carmen page for those of you who are not as familiar with dislocations.